Welcome to Volleyball State, your look at volleyball in six rotations. Here are your hosts, Jeff Sheldon and Lincoln Arneal. Hello and welcome to Volleyball State, a look at the sport of volleyball in six rotations. We are a proud part of the Herdat Sports family. He's Lincoln Arneal. I'm Jeff Sheldon. We have an incredible show for you today, headlined by an incredible guest, plus it's spring season for Husker Volleyball, so we're going to be talking a little bit of Nebraska. But first, a little podcast business. You can reach us on social media at Volleyball Pod. That's on Twitter and TikTok. Lincoln's ICQ might have been even fired back up, and we might be at Volleyball Pod there. Uh, you can always email the show at volleyballstate at gmail.com. Questions, guest ideas, critiques, factual inaccuracies, you can send them all our way at volleyballstate at gmail.com. Plus, you can find this show, plus all of our past shows, wherever you get your podcasts. And I know that is changing all the time now. So the easiest place that you can find us, if you're not a regular downloader, is to go to volleyballstate.com, and it's all there. We try to make it easy for you. Uh, on the show, in just a little bit, the Huskers have begun spring practice in preparation for their May exhibition match against Denver. We'll talk about that. The under-21 Team USA roster has been put out, at least the preliminary roster. That's got some Husker flavor as well. Plus, we just learned that the city of Omaha is going to host the first-ever Pro Volleyball Federation Championships. But first, you guys have heard me talk quite a bit already. As usual, Lincoln has the more important things to talk yes. about, and I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, give us Rotation 1 and our big headlines. Yes, for sure. Uh, usually we don't get to do a lot of uh, breaking news or kind of have any uh, breaking yeah, breaking news, but today we get to. Uh, our guest today is Jordan Larson, who is announcing that she will sign with the Omaha League One professional volleyball team. So uh, breaking news, it's, it's, it's <laughs> happening. So we welcome on Jordan Larson. Uh, she doesn't need an introduction, but just in case everyone forgot her resume, she's a three-time Olympic med medalist, uh, also serves as a Nebraska assistant coach, and probably one of the greatest uh, volleyball players in Nebraska history. And I'm going to go on a limb, probably the greatest Logan View Raider ever as well, too. So uh, quite the illustrious uh, resume that she brings. So Jordan, welcome. Thanks for joining us on Volleyball State. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's it's awesome to be here. Who would be the number two on the like highest profile Logan View Raiders? Oh, geez. and that's that's a question for Jordan, not you, Lincoln. Oh, I Goodness. have some people. <laughs> you do, that? Lincoln. Yes. You're a Northeast Nebraska guy. You probably have a whole list, right? Logan View was our arch rival growing up. Dude, Jackie Hinks is up there, man. She was she was an athlete. Her and uh, Amy Faust, Amy the Faust, duo, yeah. they, they were man. both great. Yeah, so I would... I'm curious about them playing post. Yeah. This podcast has now been micro-targeted to, like, the residents of David City and... No, it's Dodge uh, County. Hooper and maybe South Sioux City. I don't know, but yeah. everyone else, welcome to our corner of the world. Yeah, I feel some hate coming coming this way. <laughs> I'm from Southeast Nebraska. This is not right. something I've right. experienced with. All right, I get that. Cool. But thanks for joining us, Jordan. We want to talk about kind of your, the big news. Uh, joining up with uh, League One, Love Volleyball is also as they're known as. Why, before we kind of start off big picture, why was this the right professional opportunity to for you to can continue your career? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I I think I kind of touched a little bit on uh, Volleyball Mag had just uh, came out with the interview. And uh, just emotionally, I wasn't... Um, I feel like in a place to play this spring and, and I'm feeling really good um, emotionally and also physically. And uh, I would say better than I probably thought I was going to be, to be honest. I mean, as you get older, it's constantly evaluating and, and I'm kind of a player that like I'm an all in uh, person and I, I want to make sure that I'm, if I'm going to give my word and do something like I'm, I'm doing it to my fullest. And I just didn't know if I had that capacity this last spring. And so, um, and I just really love, um, what league one is, is talking about and their, their mission of just kind of seeing this path from youth to professional, you know, I was a 12 year old little girl that, you know, wanted to play in college and wanted to be pro, but I didn't know or could see what that actually looks like. Right. And so them linking up with clubs and, and kind of seeing this full, like, uh, like story kind of play out. Um, it's, it's really cool to, to be a part of that. And, and also I think the level of play is going to be unlike any other. Um, you talk about the amount of Olympians that are, um, signed with league one and kind of are the foundation. And, uh, obviously our goal, um, 
from the national team is how can we make this best league in the world? You know, cause people want to be here. Right. A, a lot of my teammates overseas are like, how do we get to the States? What's going on? Like, how do we do that? So um, I just think that it's a, I'm just also immense gratitude for people wanting to invest. I think women's sports right now is just huge and people mm-hmm. are investing in, in our, in our sport, which is just so, so awesome to see and be a part of. Yeah. I mean, how do you balance? I mean, that like desire to keep playing too. I mean, I don't know if you, what other opportunities you had too, but then this opportunity to not only play, play, play in Omaha. I mean, yep. the closest franchise is ever going to come to your hometown too. I mean, how, how did that weigh in kind of your decision to, to sign with this, this club? Yeah, totally. I mean, to be honest, like I've traveled all over the world and uh, I hadn't been back to Nebraska, obviously, since really coaching. I mean, I come back and forth, you know, visiting family, but um, obviously being back in the fall, just, you know, you remember all the things that makes Nebraska so special. And and I again, I've been afar for so long and and now being home and, and realizing, you know, just how much support I, I have and, and, and the support that the state has for the sport is just I mean, you can't describe it. And so I think the fact that I'm able to come home and be able to play and kind of, I don't know, like tail end my career with kind of where it all started, like it seems like an amazing opportunity. And so I'm just really grateful that people are still wanting to invest in me, right? Like I, you know, I'm on the older spectrum, so it makes sense why why it would be a risk, but um, I just, I'm really grateful. And I still, I still love it. Even if it's hard to warm up some days and I'm like, but when I'm in it, I am, I'm in it. And I, I just, I love strategy and talking and I don't know, all of it. It just, it, it makes me so happy. So it, it's really kind of incredible when you look at where we're going to be next year and you compare it to even like two years ago in this country where there were really no professional volleyball playing opportunities. And then, you know, you fast forward a couple of years, a couple of years later, and we're going to have not just one professional league, but but two leagues. And that's going to create, you know, hundreds of of playing, you know, over 100 playing opportunities for for women um, here in this country. When before, when you started your career, you know, you had to go to foreign countries, you played in five foreign countries, some of the biggest clubs in the world, but, you know, many time zones away. When you talk to other players, um, whether you know American based professional players, uh, players that you've been on on the Olympic team, how how fired up are they to actually have all of these professional opportunities in the U.S. and, and what are they looking for these leagues to do here in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think just opportunities, right. I think about how many girls that I know, I'm, I'm just going to give one example that assistant coach for, uh, university of Illinois, Krista, I'm going to call you out, but she played at the university of Washington, but like unbelievably talented. Right. And, um, I think if I, if I had to guess, I don't fully know the answer, but I think it was, you know, time away from family and having to go overseas and she's not alone in that. But like, I think of, the amount of talent that she had, if there were opportunities to continue to play at home and like having her be here and even some girls that retired early from the national team, if they had the opportunity to stay home, I think you would have seen them playing longer and maybe even better for their bodies. You know, when you're traveling all over the world too, like it's just really hard to do. And so, um, I don't know. I just, I, now every time I'm giving, you know, talks to, you know, younger generations i'm just like guys look at the opportunities that we have and that you have to be able to do this here and um and again a lot of my teammates overseas they're like i want to come how do i get it how do i get why is the united states have not figured out yet you know and i think that's the main question and so i hope with all this momentum that um that we get a lot of people behind it because it's it's really huge for our sport when you look at the the rosters, when I look at them and both the Pro Volleyball Federation, Athletes Unlimited, and now um, Love Volleyball, I, I, a lot of the names on the rosters are going to be very familiar to people um, who have followed college volleyball over the last couple of years, where I feel like... Um, I, I almost feel, you know, I have some sympathy for these players kind of in that age, age range that you mentioned with Krista Van Zandt, who I, I think might have even been a National Player of the Year or was certainly yeah. an All-American Players about her age, and I look, you know, it, we're talking the age of Kelly Hunter and and the Rolfsons here at Nebraska, people who graduated, you know, in, in 2015, 2017. If these leagues had come along 
three to four to five years earlier, you have a whole nother generation of people who have professional opportunities to play in the U.S., who, you know, maybe it wasn't attractive for that to them to say, okay, I can go play, but I'm going to have to go to Turkey or Italy or China. And, and that just completely changed the course of how they wanted to um, enter their professional lives, I guess. Let's, let's put it that way. And so I, I really, you know, I think it's a bummer when I think about that, that, that not that these leagues, you, know, you can't put them in a time machine, but if we had had this five years earlier, there's a whole different, you know, kind of generation of of pine, professional pioneers in volleyball. And do you ever talk with um, players in, in maybe that age range or former players? And are they, do they sort of like shake their fist at the sky and be like, where was this? Where were these opportunities five years earlier? Yeah, totally. I mean, I even joke with Kelly every day. I'm like, Kelly, when are you going to come out of retirement? You know, it's like it, unbelievably talented, right? And just an awesome teammate. And uh, obviously I play with her athletes unlimited for, and now like working alongside her. And I'm just like, man, like the, these people have to end up choosing a different path, even if they maybe want to choose this other path, it's just not even an option. And, or it is an option, but like you said, it's far and it, it does, it takes a lot of sacrifice. And so, um, I like, you're right. I, I think even the Rolfson twins, you know, like could, what could happen? And even for our, again, I, I think I see it now from our national team standpoint, I'm like, it took us 60 years to win a gold medal. Like for me, that is crazy, you know, and the amount of talent we have, you know, I look at a country, you know, maybe like Serbia that are unbelievably talented and the population is like, I don't even know like what it is compared to ours, but it's mm -hmm. very, very small. And I just think that like, we just have so much talent that we can continue to build off of. And these opportunities are just continuing to help girls keep their dreams alive and then to keep their passion alive. Like, right. It's, and I, I think people enjoy watching the game of volleyball. People enjoy watch, you know, going and, um, and I guess I just hope that, um, we can create an environment. I know people haven't seen international volleyball or what it's like to play in a game in Italy, but like the fans are just so involved. They're, you know, like they're really energetic. So I hope we can kind of create an environment of like along that, that they, the fans have a great experience as well and want to be a part of it just as much as we want to. You, you do realize you're talking about Nebraska fans. And yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> for volleyball. I, I think that, I don't think they have any problem uh, getting excited and creating that atmosphere no matter where you play. So. Yeah, totally. You're right. You're right. So yeah, no, I'm, I, I, I think that's what I'm also most excited is just to see like our fans to be able to be a part of it and um, just how much it can grow. Cause I know it's going to, it's going to do well. Yeah. I mean, this is a hypothetical too, but I mean, you mentioned in the Volleyball Mag article too that the opportunities are still presenting themselves. I mean, do you think that opportunities would have presented yourself in foreign countries that you would have gone to that or because this is an opportunity in the United States that this is too good to pass up? Yeah, no, I, I still had opportunities to go overseas uh, and play. And uh, again, I just had kind of made the decision uh, to to forego and, and to really make sure that I was good and healthy and strong. And, um, you know, it's it, it's a wear and tear, even just practicing uh, daily. It's a it's a mindfulness grind every day. And so um, I just feel like this was the best opportunity for me. And, and also, too, I I. I think even committing to the Huskers, right? Like being on staff, like I committed my time to there as well. And I, I'm really grateful to be in that community. And, and I feel uh, I wanted to give as much as I could for them as well. We're with Jordan Larson on Volleyball State. The, Jordan has just announced that she is going to be playing professionally after the Olympics are done this summer with the new uh, League One Volleyball setup, which is going to have a franchise in Omaha. There's uh, five, five other markets uh, around the country as well. Jordan, what have you seen sort of in the development of League One, the, the leadership, the setup of the league that made this league really attractive for you? Why do you think it's going to be successful? Yeah, yeah. Um... That's a great question. I mean, I think that uh, there are a lot of women behind the scenes and a lot of women that are taking on really big roles and and stepping into a place that maybe traditionally you would see, you know, someone else doing. And, and that's also encouraging, you know, is that um, being a part of, of something that's maybe never been done before. And, and that's in that uh, situation has been awesome. Um, and then again, I think also who is representing us on the, from the national team. You, again, you look at Olympians, former national team players, the level is going to be like, you know, today we're in the gym, you know, talking, you know, certain teams and, and what's happening and who's going to be where. And it's like, man, these teams are going to be stacked. So, um, and then I think too, 
right? At the year of the Olympics, you know, people or young kids now can say like, hey, I watched this person in the Olympics and now I can go watch them right at home. Like, I mean, what a cool experience, you know? I, I remember meeting my, you know, like Allison Weston once, you know, or, you know, like it's, it's going to be more people get to interact more with, with their icons or their, their, um, you know, who they dream of being one day. And I think that can only add even more, more depth and empowerment to, to our youth. And, uh, the more we can expand on that, the greater it is for our sport for sure. Yeah. Uh, league one will actually get started in January of 2025. Uh, but there's training camps before that. However, I imagine you probably want to be busy up until the week before Christmas coaching with duties. Have you, I mean, this is very long ways away, maybe a future problem too, but what is that going to look like too? How are you going to balance staying in playing shape, getting ready for another professional season while you're being an assistant coach in Nebraska? Yeah. Um, well, I'm really lucky that Don is super supportive and obviously supportive of just, I think just in general, the growth of the sport. Right. And I made sure that he was aware of kind of what my demands were going to be and, and if it was an alignment and if he was going to be okay with it. And so, um, like you said, there's going to be a pre term or pre like season, right. I think we would, I think we come together like November 11th or so. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'll be kind of doing double duty. So I'll be practicing probably in the morning, uh, in Omaha and then uh, coaching in the afternoon uh, with the Huskers and then traveling with the Huskers. So whenever the Huskers are going, like that's first and foremost, my priority in the fall. Um, and then things will kind of shift more once we go in season in January. So um, I'm again, very lucky that I have a fantastic team behind me um, and just people that are there to support me, strength coach, nutritionist, uh, people dealing with contracts. Like I just, I feel very, very lucky that I have a good support system and people, um, taking care of me and, and putting me in a really good position. So, well, before we get to what could happen, you know, this fall and this winter, we, there's still the, the, the little thing of what's going to happen here in a couple months, which is, um, the Olympics in Paris and in, in July, um, which is a big goal of yours as well. And I know you're involved with some, some team USA training coming up soon. Give us a little look behind the curtain of what your Olympic preparations look like. How are you spending your time right now? Kind of splitting things between California and Nebraska and, and what's the next thing coming up in the team USA gym. Yeah. So, uh, training with USA Monday, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, usually Wednesday is kind of our, our down day or more of a recovery day where we're not jumping. Um, and then mostly weekends are off. So also that's allowing me to do some recruiting. So recruiting on the weekends for Nebraska and then I'll see some uh, practices here in California, which has been nice that our coaches don't have to fly all the way out here. I can actually go see some of our players that we're looking at. So it's been a really, really nice. Um, and then also my, my thing is just continue to build relationships with the Huskers, right? When I'm from afar and, and kind of checking in, seeing how they're doing physically, mentally, um, I'm able to watch practice thanks, thanks to volumetrics. So I'm very much uh, in tune on what the Huskers are working on and how I can be a small piece of that. Um, and then, yeah, we are actually having a couple friendly matches here at the end of April. Uh, Japan is coming out um, and we're going to do a couple friendlies with them. And then we will take off for VNL, which would be May 11th. And then roster cuts, I think, will be a couple weeks after that. We have a couple weeks of VNL, then roster cuts. So we are training with 23. We'll go down to 14. Uh, only 12 will, will suit at the Olympic Games. Um, so, and then obviously the Olympics are um, end of sorry, end of July, beginning of August, mm -hmm. but we have Netherlands also coming out for some games before then as well. So, um, and then I will come back as soon as the Olympics are over. Obviously this is the dream plan, right? Like yeah. we don't actually know. And uh, that's, but that's the ultimate hope. Just real quick, real quick for the listeners, VNL is the Volleyball Nations League that uh, the U.S. is going to be playing in. It's kind of this year it's going to serve as an Olympic tune-up tournament, but it's going to be in May and June. And it kind of happens all over the world, right? I think you all start playing maybe in Brazil, but it can it can literally take you all over the globe, right? Yep. Yep. So we go Brazil, Texas and Japan, I believe, if I got that right. So, um, yeah, uh, there's actually one more uh place in there that I forget, but sure, there are matches there. going on in Turkey. I don't know if you're playing there, but matches yeah. are happening in Turkey. Yeah. I should probably look at our schedule more detail, but I do know <laughs> that I think Brazil is starting first and then we go to Arlington, Texas. And then, uh, the third week, I don't remember. And then I think the finals might be in Japan. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I, I should know better, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> 
there'll be a long plane ride from somewhere, no matter where you're going. Exactly. You just get used to it. You know, <laughs> you talk about that player group of 23 people and you'll cut down eventually too. I mean, how, how is the player pool different now than it was in 2020? Um, and what are some team, what, what are some players that are the Nebraska fans may be familiar with and kind of, or the college volleyball fans may be familiar with? Yeah. So uh, we also, before 2020, we had a group of 23 as well. Um, and so similar format, uh, we have a lot of girls still playing in Europe, so they're on their way back. Um, but Husker fans will probably obviously remember Justine and uh, Kelsey Robinson as well. So they are training and very much in the mix, uh, both having great seasons overseas and, and doing quite well. Um, so it's going to be good to have them back and in the gym. Now, we should mention Justine as the other athlete that's been assigned to volleyball uh, league, league one and in, uh, in Omaha too. So I imagine you're pumped to have your the libero, the top libero in the United States uh, to be, be, be sent up those passes for you to terminate. I imagine. Exactly. And Justine is just such a rock star human. And I, I'm just, it's so interesting because, uh, and I think also we're grateful as a national team is like, normally we just get the summer to play together. You know, it's like we get five months and then everybody's like, all right, see you later. And now I'm like, Hey Jay, like I get to hang out with you again and like actually get to play with you longer <laughs> than five months. So I'm, I am just so excited. And, um, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I just can't wait to obviously play with her. And then obviously for the Husker fans to come out and see, I mean, she is just an awesome player. Obviously I'm biased, but I, I'm just so proud of her and all, all that she's overcome over the years. It looks like a, a lot of the the names on the at least like the preliminary rosters or who are involved in the USA program are going to be veterans from the the 2020 Olympics. Have there been any uh, like retirements or players who have certainly from 2020 said, "Hey, I, I'm stepping away. That was great, a great note to go out on." But you know, is is Faluka still in the mix, or who are some of the players who um, might have stepped away since 2020? Yeah, um, so Faluka had another baby, um, so oh, she. Wow. Yeah, so she probably won't her. be. Yeah, won't be coming back. Um, uh, Barch, uh, Michelle Barch Hackley. She's coaching at Ohio State. She's actually playing for PVF as well. Um, yeah. But she uh, has, I believe, chosen not to come back to the national team. Um, and then um, Kim Hill also. She is um, going to school, getting. Um, I think she's going into design of some kind. I I'm, don't yeah. want to speak for her, but I think it's something along those lines. And so, um, and then I'm trying to think anybody else, I think pretty much everybody else is still in it. So, um, which is kind of cool. Like you said, we have a lot of returners, which gives us, you know, a good foundation. And, but obviously those, those people were huge assets for us and um, uh, played an important role. And, um, but I, I'm, I'm confident that we're in a pretty good place as a team. And I think we, we, we really emphasize culture and being a good teammate and showing up for each other. And um, that's still very much a part of us. And, um, and I, again, there's just something about when you come back for the summer of the Olympics, it's there's a different mm -hmm. vibe. There's a different sense of energy and, and yeah, people are, fired up. Well, and one of the great things about the Olympic cycles too, is uh, you get to kind of see some new faces in the gym as well. So, I mean, Nebraska fans got sick of seeing Catherine Plummer when yeah. she was putting balls away at Stanford. Now you put her in a red, white, and blue Jersey. And, you know, she seems like she's a name that we've heard fighting for, for a roster spot for, for Paris as well. And, you know, of course you're going to see Kelsey Robinson. And so, you know, if you've been following college volleyball at all for the last four or five years, you know, now is when you get to see maybe some of those players that you remember um, on the All-American teams, like fighting for Olympic spots, too. So it seems like there could be some spots maybe for, for some new faces on the roster as well. Totally. And I, I just want to speak a little bit to that as like as an athlete, you know, you you get like in college, there's these big rivals and things. And then when you come on the on the U.S. team, it's like all of a sudden now we're all one and now we're mm -hmm. all trying to figure out. And so it's really cool to now obviously you want to see other people do well, but now like celebrating each other's successes, even when it's like quote unquote arrival or, you know, things like that um, from the college scene. So we have immense talent as an, as a nation and, um, and just to see even Kat like kind of come into her own and, and how, how much she has just improved over the years. Um, and it's really cool. So, um, but I can see how Husker fans were like, what this is, you know, like you said, like they, they, they have a hard time understanding, but it's now being yeah. on this. And I think also too, the professional leagues are going to allow this like integral, like 
I don't know, piece of all that of like, oh, this person played here and now I can follow yeah. here. And yeah, see if, if they, you can take a college rival and if they end up helping your professional franchise win a championship or help Team USA win a gold medal, I think everyone gets real forgiving real quick. <laughs> exactly. I would relate to the, my personal life too. I've, I'm willing to move past uh, any Logan View hatred I have and accept Jordan as a, a very part, big part of my exactly. life. So I, I take that. Yeah, you gotta, part, you gotta let it go. You gotta <laughs> let it go, Lincoln. Yeah, let it go, dude. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding it's, it's gone it's gone yeah uh, we kind of about talking about welcoming uh, uh all these new players too uh, on the other end of that when do you know the end is here you kind of mentioned the people that are leaving that but but when do you know when it's time to stop playing do you think that you'll kind of decide that you're done based on what you've accomplished or how your body feels or maybe as long as the opportunities are coming let's run it back yeah no it's a great question um you know i think i I had said a little bit earlier on and just like when I'm all, when I'm in, I'm like all in. And when I don't feel like I can have that or bring that capacity, then I think that's when I feel like I've, I don't, I owe that to those around me. You know, I, I hold myself to a pretty high standard. And um, if that standard's not being met daily, then, um, then I think that's where I need to evaluate what's right and what's wrong. So um, again, right now I'm, and I think a lot of that is, is my body and how I'm doing and how am I responding. And so uh, I think as I've gotten older, I've just gotten smarter on what contracts to take, how to do this, what's rest, you know, all that and, and recovery and all that has been really important. So um, I think that's mainly going to be the the main thing. Yeah. Well, we'll kind of switch gears here a little bit. Talk about you. I mean, you just completed your first year uh, with assistant coach with Nebraska too. And Nebraska had an amazing year too. Uh, but it, now I know the season didn't end how you wanted wanted it to end. Is mm-hmm. that Texas match still sticking with you? Do you think about it on the daily and like just figure out how to get that one match better for for the Huskers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a good lesson. Um, I would wouldn't say that I'm I'm hanging on to it necessarily, um, but I I do think it's a good learning good learning tool. Um, I just think we have to continue to focus on our side of the net. We have really great athletes and how can we just get, you know, maybe it's one read better or are we seeing the ball, you know, better? Are we hitting our serve stronger? You know, I think it's how can we put, turn it back onto us and, and ultimately like, you know, you learn this as you kind of play. It's like, sometimes you just got to give credit to the other team. I'm Texas played like unreal. Right. So it's like some of those games happen. And, you know, I, I guarantee you, maybe if we saw them again, that you would have a very different outcome. And so I think that's what makes also the national championship unique is you got one shot. And, you know, like we're maybe overseas, like right now, the Italian final is going best of five. Right. So mm-hmm. I think when you have a, a series, you know, you kind of maybe see who maybe best team at some point, but like it's just a different format and a different way of determining what actually is or what isn't you know and so um i think you know texas played unbelievable that that night but you know again i think if it was a different night maybe it would have a different outcome so i i I have a lot of trust in our players and what they do every day and um and how we're trying to get better and i think if we remain keeping our focus on our side of the net we'll we'll do good things Jordan, what was the biggest coaching lesson that you learned last year in in your first year at Nebraska? You being kind of a part of a coaching team, not necessarily just a playing team and coaching under John and and his staff. And maybe what was the biggest surprise that you kind of left the season with as well? Yeah, I really just tried to go in observing uh, and really understanding. Obviously, the season was quite underway when I entered. And so I I didn't want to make too much of a ripple because everybody, they kind of had their routine and, and kind of what they did. So I just really tried to observe and where can I fit in and make it the best for everyone. Um, and I think that I'm still trying to figure out like what is quote unquote my coaching style and kind of what, um, how do I want to feel and how do I want the players to feel when they're around me? Um, and so I think the biggest thing was a lot of just internal dialogue of myself, uh, evaluating like, okay, how kind of, how did I do today? And then how can I do better the next day? And then, you know, I think it's just conversations too of like checking in with our coaches and like kind of, Hey, what do you need more of? What do you need less of? And and what do you want to see from me? Um, I think having those, those, um, those conversations was really important, but I, 
like you, you said the coaching team, I, I really see it as a team. We are a team and how do we get the best out of our team? So um, I think we're constantly having that conversation as well as how can we be better and how can we help these young athletes navigate? And I think it's just, it takes me back. You know, I think of when I was a student athlete and like what was going through my mind and like how at the time it's like, oh yeah, like I, I, I know. And like, you know, but it, there's just so much, changing and you're trying to multitask and go to school and there's just a lot of distraction that um that you're trying to do and they have a lot of stress and they're trying to be really really good it's a hard thing to do and so i think giving grace and understanding and and just being for them being there for them emotionally is is huge for sure well, cool well thanks for uh, one last question i mean our, it sounds like you got a lot on your play you got the volleyball nation leagues and you got to, hopefully the the Olympics, and then you come back right back. Nebraska's in season, then you go straight into playing professionally. I mean, are, are you gonna have any time to take it like Jordan time or like <laughs> eat press or relax or do anything fun? Are, we, are, are you gonna have any time for yourself in the next year? You know, I'm I see your your shirt here, the Masters. I'm actually just gonna turn it on, I'm gonna you know sit down and watch some golf. Um, you know, it's so funny. I I just I love being around it. Actually being around the game, like really energizes me. And I love talking about it. I love talking about high performance and, and don't get me wrong. I'm getting little pieces here and there of where I can kind of check out and, and, and do time for me. But ultimately this stuff really just fires me up and I am just really honored to still be a part of it. Right. Like I think this, my direction in, in life could look very different and I know that, and I'm not trying to take a day for granted. So just trying to sit in that and really celebrate it as it comes. And, and, uh, cause I know it's, it's, uh, it could, you, you just never know. You never know. Life could, could change. And, uh, just really want to be grateful and thankful for the path. So. All right, Jordan Larson, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations again on the big opportunity with league one. Good luck over the next couple months with team USA. And thank you so much for joining us on volleyball. Yeah. State. Thanks for having us. And thanks for all you're doing for our sport. You bet. Thanks, Absolutely. <sighs> Well, Lincoln, um, it it sounds like, you know, he, you mentioned if she's going to be able to take any time off, like maybe like Wednesdays, but through the rest <laughs> of the year, her schedule is kind of uh, scheduled out is as long as she makes um, the Olympic team, which I think, you know, she probably has a pretty good shot at doing. I don't know that Karch would be bringing her along on uh, Volleyball Nations League and all of this. Um and Karch also likes his veterans, as we as we have yeah. seen. So I think Jordan's probably got um, a spot there. But then playing through August, coaching through December, and then immediately jumping into a professional season where you could be playing again through May. I mean, that's almost what's that like ten straight months of being in, oh, involved yeah. with volleyball in some way. And and it's not like when she's coaching, she's going to take a lot of physical time off because she's still training. Like this kind of feels like a big. Um, I don't know if you're going to call it a swan song for someone who's who's right now 37 years old. Like, I don't know how many more years you could do something like this. Yeah, it's a it's a high physical demand, too. And to be able to perform at the level that she does, um, it takes a lot of like uh, in the volleyball mag had that great article again to reference it. But like just the t the training and to be able to have your body perform at that level, too. And she's younger than we are. And I know just to get my slightly. Body Going. slightly yeah. younger than we are she's younger than both of us <laughs> uh i mean just to get the body this i mean even if you're a peak athlete there is a slight decline but she's what she's been able to do is impressive i mean even, uh, we'll see about playing time too but i think she has a good chance to make that team and just the mm -hmm. leadership the expertise um and just kind of her overall demeanor i think will be an asset to the united states um whether she's on the court or not too i think that she's going to be a big part of what uh, what, what the United States does this summer. Yeah. And hopefully we'll see her in Paris and uh, see how the United States does as they defend their gold medal. Well, and I think it's a pretty big coup for for love to okay. to get Jordan Larson. I mean, I know that they have a connection with USA Volleyball. Um, I also, you know, uh, we, we we've we've skirted around this story a couple of times. We should endorse it fully. People should go to volleyballmag.com and and read Leo Biga's story um, interview with Jordan Larson because she talks about a lot of stuff in there that we didn't get a chance to touch on in our in a short podcast interview. But she said in that story she had other professional opportunities. If she wanted to, she could be playing in the pro volleyball federation right now um and and you know in her words she said she wasn't emotionally ready to to jump back in and play um also i think it's it's probably a, a calculated decision where if you are 37 you know you want to be able to kind of rest your body a little bit going into the biggest athletic challenge you probably have left which is being a part of the the olympic team this summer 
So I think that was probably part of it. But, you know, all these leagues are would in the U.S. as you're trying to sell tickets and you're trying to grow a brand like you need these high profile stars like Jordan Larson. Yeah. Jordan Larson's maybe the most decorated American volleyball player of the last 10, 15 years, maybe longer. Um, and so I think it's it's a pretty big coup on Love's part to be able to pull a player like her. And they're also getting former Huskers. And I imagine they're all going to end up on the Omaha team. But Maddie Kubik's going to play for Love. Kelsey Robinson Cook. Uh, we mentioned Justine, Lauren Stiverins. And, you know, there's a lot of, if you look at the market setup of Love, it's usually, they're, I think they're all in big, um, big time college markets. So you've got, Omaha is kind of in Nebraska central. Um, Atlanta is a little bit of the exception, but Atlanta is the other market besides Omaha that's going to have both a love team and a PVF team. Um, Houston and Austin can draw on the Texas star power. So I think you're going to see former Texas stars end up on those teams. Madison, Wisconsin. Gee, I wonder what players they're going to have on their roster. I think Lauren Carlini's already lined up mm -hmm. to play for love. And I know there's some former BYU players in there like um, Ronnie Jones Perry. And I forget if Mary Lake, their, their libero, um, uh, is is playing in this league as well. I know she had a baby not too long ago, but you could have some former BYU stars on a on a Salt Lake City team, and yeah. so uh, wouldn't that be cool? Um, you know, for for Love to be able to roll out their first Omaha team with like four or five former Nebraska stars on it. Yeah, and I know they they've assigned several players. Kelsey Robinson Cook has I think assigned to Atlanta, but everyone else oh, is, is just signing with the league. Yeah, I mean, um, Justine Wong Arantes is the only one assigned to Omaha, and obviously now Jordan is too. But yeah, that's it, it's it's a really is a big coup for them, big win for them. You think about um, take a time travel back to the mid '90s when the WNBA was starting. There was a was it the ABL? Well, there's a competing league as well that started off like the year before. I, I'm, ABL. I forgot. I have completely forgotten this. So but, I will believe anything the, you say. But they rode, rode the wave of the 96 Olympics and all those Olympians then just went into um, the uh, WNBA and kind of gave that. So we'll see what a, a lot of these players who become household names this summer. We'll see how if the United States can defend their uh, gold medal. That'll be a big boost for this league to uh, to really kind of ride that way. So it'll be mm -hmm. it, it, it's this is I mean. I, I'm trying to think of the equivalent in a different sport too, but Jordan, like you said, Jordan Larson is the name in volleyball. She was the most outstanding player in the 20, 2020 Olympics and um, is really a big get for them and kind of really gives credence to that. So it's, it's exciting for them, but mm -hmm. uh, we still got a ways to go before that starts. And we'll get to see a lot of these people in action uh, this summer at the Olympics. And, and I think, you know, we, we can run through it one more time. We've done it before on the show, but just one of the main differences between the PVF and love is the pro volleyball federation. So like the league, the Omaha supers and Nova's are in are all independently owned franchises with local ownership groups. Um, league one volleyball love is going to be kind of centrally owned. Uh, the league decides what teams rosters are going to be. So you sign with the league and then the league will place you on a team. So it's not like free agency trades, things like that. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure like how they're going to do, you know, cut downs and whether, you know, someone who gets cut on one team is going to have an opportunity with another team like the PVF did. Um, but if you know, if you like volleyball and, and you live in the U.S., this is going to be a really interesting setup to follow over, I'm going to guess, the next two to three years and, and, you know, where we sit now going into a year where there's going to be two professional leagues what does this look like in three or four years? Are there still going to be two professional leagues? Is there going to be some sort of combination? Um, I, I don't know that the country is going to be able to sustain um, two professional leagues long term, especially when you've got um, two cities in Omaha and Atlanta that are going to have franchises in each. Like, you know, God bless us in Nebraska, but I don't know that, you know, we're going to be able to sustain that uh, long term. But I think, you know, this is just really interesting. I hate the the sort of techie term disruption. Um, but like, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the big bang of professional volleyball in the US. And it's just going to be kind of a messy in some ways, yeah. for a little while, but there's going to be a lot of opportunity and innovation. And I think when the dust settles, you're going to have, you know, professional opportunities to play um, in a volleyball league in the US that American players just never had before. And, and I, I meant what I said to Jordan, my heart does go out to, you know, if Michaela Fecky had a chance to play professionally in Omaha, when she was done with her college career, like, would she be would she have done it? And would she still be playing volleyball? I don't know. But I, I I'm sad that I never got a chance to find that out.
For sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it is an exciting time. My great fear is that the two leagues cannibalize each other and they split up the talent and they uh, both wither out and die. That's my great fear. Hopefully it doesn't come true. Hopefully they figure out the best model, figure out the best markets and get everyone together yeah. and we can have a big team with like 16 teams or whatever. Yeah. But I think that we mentioned before earlier during the interview that there is a third professional team, Athletes Unlimited. They, they're they a very different model. I mean, their season only lasts a month. And a lot of the PVF players that are playing this year played in Athletes Unlimited. It's almost kind of like a good tune-up, yeah. almost like spring training yeah. uh, for them as they gear up into the season two. So I think that's kind of a different model. It's more player based. Yeah. Uh, Athletes Unlimited is about players. The other yeah. two leagues are about teams and that's why I think, you know, one of those leagues, PBF or Love, are, are ultimately going to be um, who emerge sort of victorious if we're looking at this as a fight. And, you know, I hear your concern about cannibalizing each other. I don't think that's going to happen. I think there will be some sort of survival of the fittest. I think some of these leagues might just have structural advantages over the others. And I think in three years, you're going to have one league um, and, and who emerges victorious and what how many teams there are, I think, is still sort of up to compete for. But yeah, I would love to see a professional league in the U.S. that maybe has 10 to 12 teams across the country, because I don't think either of these leagues can just um, exist long term with with, I think, six market so love has six markets the pbf has what nine there's seven right now, right now seven. They're in three next year so it'll be at 10 in the year okay two. yeah so i mean this is really a cool time um and i think you know being in nebraska here we get a front row seat of it and as long as these leagues can maybe find a broadcast partner then everyone can have a front row seat for it but you know compared to where we were sitting five or six years ago um this is really awesome to see for for volleyball in the u.s yeah, yeah. Jordan Larson will be coming to an arena near Omaha as well soon. So that's, thanks again for her for joining us. But uh, let's move on and talk about some other, stay on the topic of professional volleyball news. You teased this at the beginning as well, too. Uh, but speaking of Nebraska and Omaha and professional volleyball, Omaha was selected as the host to uh, to get to welcome the first Pro Volleyball Federation playoffs. They'll play the semifinals on May 15th. There'll be two matches at night on a Wednesday and then on Saturday uh, the 18th, the championship match for the first league, our first season of Pro Volleyball Federation will be at CHI Health Center in Omaha. Tickets are on sale now, so um, hopefully they're going, they're going, they're going fast. And uh, I think they're they're planning for a whole week of it as well, too. I mean, uh, Wednesday night is like I said, the semifinals, and they're having like a player banquet where they hand out the season long awards. They'll have a fan mm-hmm. fest Friday night, so they're making it a big production and making it a big time deal. I had a chance to talk to with Omaha. Supernova's team president, Diane Mendenhall, and their expertise, and they really tapped into the expertise of hosting championship mm-hmm. events at, at the CHI Center really kind of paid off. And also their crowds of 10,000 people that they get regularly um, at CHI yeah. is paying off for them. Yeah, it's kind of a no-brainer, I think, when you look at the attendance numbers, you look at the the match presentation that, that Omaha is able to put put out there um we've both been to matches and, and kind of seen what that's like and then it's also kind of a no-brainer because it looks like omaha's in pretty good shape to be one of the four teams uh in the semifinals. right now atlanta and omaha are the only two teams in the pbf that are over 500 um we're actually taping this a few days before this episode is going to post so we're taping it before omaha and atlanta play on saturday night i believe so by the time you hear this um those teams will either be a game closer in the standings together or Atlanta will have put even more distance between themselves and Omaha. But really, I mean, Omaha is going to have home court advantage as long as they are in one of those, uh, those top four spots. And so, and the other teams that could join them, I think is there's really a fight for it because everyone else is kind of hovering around 500 until you get down to, I think Las Vegas, which is several matches under 500, but this could be really interesting. You know, you, we've already seen recently that, Omaha can play up to competition. They can play down to competition. They dropped a match at San Diego, which is a few matches under 500 uh, about a week ago. And, uh, you know, I think they're still kind of figuring out the best ways that they can be successful. And they got a big match coming up on Saturday against uh, Atlanta that we'll all know the outcome of by the time you hear this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So exciting times. Omaha yeah, it does figure to be in that. It's going to be a wild race to the end. I mean, this that starts mid-May. We talked about to see who the other two teams. It could. I think it could be any of the other five teams in the league. There's only a couple of games separating. They all have like 
uh, four or five. I think Orlando has this third with seven wins right now. So there's a lot, a lot to be decided on the court too, but Hey, we're talking professional volleyball. What a, what a time to be alive. So, yeah, well, let's switch gears now to, um, semi-professional volleyball. I don't know what to call it with NIL now. I mean, players make money, but there, it's not explicitly for, um, for playing volleyball, but let's turn our attention to the Huskers. Lincoln, are you heading out to Kearney in uh, early May to, to watch them play Denver? It'll be my second trip to Kearney that week, but I will be out there. Yeah, Saturday, May 4th, I will watch Nebraska take on Denver at the UNK campus. It is a official sellout. They sold out at uh, 46 minutes uh, at Buffalo County Fairgrounds. They got rid of all of the – I think they just sold about just over 3,000. There were some pre-sales that happened. There will be a capacity crowd of 5,000. There were uh, – I just got I got done talking to the uh, Carney uh, activities director earlier this afternoon, and he said that they held some back. So uh, Carney High School teachers and faculty and staff members, they pre-sold them so they didn't have to wait out in line at uh, 2 a.m. Uh, before going and teaching our young minds of, of Carney, <laughs> Carney High School to uh, do that. So they, they did held some back, but there will be a capacity crowd out there. So it's going to be a fun, a fun atmosphere and fun event. The spring match is, is getting to the point where if they if they don't sell out in the first hour, it's it's almost disappointing. But what they sold this out in, in 45 minutes, which like you never want to like John Cook said when they announced that you never want to take it for granted. But also it's not a surprise. So um, they're going to see uh, they're going to see the Denver Pioneers on May 4th. Here's some of the things that I'm looking for in the spring match. Um, obviously, how's Lindsey Krause look? Lincoln, you were at a media availability um, earlier this week. And I, I, did they not say that, that she's, she's, she's not injured anymore. She's back to full health, but yeah. she's still getting herself back into playing shape. Is that yeah, accurate? We, yeah. We talked to her specifically and she said that, I mean, yeah, she's going through full bore of all the practices. Uh, she said that one thing that's still regaining strength is her vertical, her vertical isn't what it was prior to the injury too, but it's getting better week by week too. So um, I don't know if she'll be at a complete 100% of where she was. We saw her when she was big 10 player of the week in early October last year, but uh, she'll be back on the court swinging away, looking like Lindsay Krause of old. So um, I, it may be very minuscule difference that we might not be able Mm -hmm. to tell. Well, and so, and I imagine they're not going to play her in the entire match, maybe give, um, although, you know, their roster is a little bit, um, hamstrung from from where it would have been last fall because you're not gonna have Allie Batenhorst playing in that match I don't believe um she is her time as a Husker yeah she has been practicing with them I don't believe she's gonna play uh in that match but um you know they've kind of kept her a part of the sisterhood until she graduates and officially moves on to USC um this summer I'm also interested to see how Kennedy Ord looks If, if she gets a set maybe to play to spell Berg and Riley um, and and see kind of what she looks like running this offense. Because I think, you know, as we saw last year when Lindsey Krause missed half the season with an ankle injury, you're one practice accident away from not having a setter if Bergen Riley goes down and they need a strong backup setter. And is that Kennedy or, or is that, you know, something that you're going to be concerned about going into the fall? I, I really be interested to see what Kennedy looks like if she gets a chance to play uh, in Kearney uh, on May 4th. Yeah, we haven't seen her. She's been a serving specialist the past year, and then she didn't really get a chance to even – I don't think any sets really run the offense. There may have been one time where they were running the 6-2 where she stepped in, but, uh, yeah, she really hasn't done it. But, I, I mean, I have a feeling that she'll be on the team this fall. I don't think that we'll see any portal def- defections um, come May when it opens back up. Uh, I think that she's bought in, and she's a very key mm-hmm. culture piece for what Nebraska is doing yeah. and. Uh, they like her to keep her around. I think similar to what we've seen in football, the majority of transfer portal movement will happen right after the season gets over, but there will be another transfer portal um, opening in May. I think once the uh, the spring season, excuse me, gets done. So if you were going to see player movement, you know, you're, you seem pretty set uh, sure of yourself that there's not going to be one. I've gotten to the point where nothing really surprises me anymore. If, if somebody announced they were leaving um i wouldn't spend a lot of time you know pulling up to my fainting couch so there could be a chance for a may surprise i guess um maybe maybe you hope not if you're a husker fan because you got to like the roster you have but at the same time um you know i i have been saying on this show for months that like i think there might be one more player to move and you know i'm not going to throw that out there just because it it might be considered insulting to 
one of the players and I have no interest in doing that, but you know, the way that we have seen player movement over the last couple of years, just that merry-go-round seems to never stop spinning. And if somebody decided that they were going to leave, if they got their degree in May and became a grad transfer somewhere, like that's not going to shock me. And I don't think I'm like trying to be Nostradamus here by, by saying it just because we've seen so much player movement all across the country every time the portal opens. Yeah, and grad transfers actually don't have to wait till May. They can go in right now. If you're on track to get your diploma, uh, grad transfers can enter at any time. In fact, I think they have to enter. They have a deadline when they have to be in. Maybe that's May 1st, May 2nd as well, too. They have to be in before um, this kind of the semester ends. So mm -hmm. that's a possibility, too. And uh, we don't really know. Like We don't know. If, if there are schools that want to be a big NIL player in volleyball, you know, you could have been making contact to club coaches or family members or sliding into DMs or something in January and February and March and and trying to see maybe who dangle that hook out there and see what bites you might get. So, you know, I think player, player movement is not going to stop at least until some other major structural happen things happen in college sports um, that might happen in the next couple of years. But um, like I said, nothing Nothing surprised me. Yeah. Uh, the other big news in Husker world, uh, Harper Murray was cited for a DUI on the early morning of April 5th. Um, I don't know what that uh, will lead to her future. Uh, I did talk to Kelly Hunter. She spoke at the Lincoln uh, Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, had a meeting uh, the Wednesday after that incident. She said she's still practicing. They are wrapping her arms around her, kind of trying to support her through this difficult time. Um we don't know anything that's going on, uh, any legal proceedings or things that's happening like that. So there's nothing new to report with that. But uh, as far as we know, she's still proud with the team. Um, and what other repercussions mm -hmm. may come from that incident um, have yet to be determined or not been announced publicly, at least. Yeah. Uh, and, and my guess is going to be that that she will face some kind of brief suspension. I think, you know, when you when it reaches to this isn't just a violation of team rules. You you're arrested. You had a fake ID. You got a DUI. Like a coach kind of has to step up and, um, oh, yeah. and, and enforce some accountability. So, it, you know, this is completely idle speculation. My guess is, is she is going to, to miss a match or two early on in the season and that's going to be it. And, and everyone's going to move along and that has nothing to do with like the legal repercussions that, that she might face as well, which I'm not a lawyer. So I don't really even, can't even begin to guess what that might be, but um, you know, not not a uh, a welcome situation in in Husker volleyball land, and uh, it's a distraction that you probably don't need going into um, going into your spring practice. Yeah, I think that I agree. I think there will be playing time to miss, but she will not be kicked off the team, as far as we know. Um, and yeah, it's an unfortunate situation. You, I'm glad no one was hurt, but um, you hate to see that decisions were made that ended up to lead this. So we hope Harper Murray's getting the help and support that she needs to make it through this time as well, too. But um, this is a serious legal legal ramification too, as so mm -hmm. um, consequences will be felt. So you were at the media availability um, last week. We talked about Lindsey Krause just a little bit. What, what were some of the other big takeaways that you um, that you got from from sitting down with some of the team and coaches? Yeah, we talked about Lin Lindsey Krause's back from injury. Uh, so was Becca Alex. She sat out the beach season. Um, they mentioned whatever procedure she had. I don't. We were it was unclear what procedure she had, but um, she's wasn't doing any physical uh, activities as far as volleyball training um, since really the season ended, but she is, uh, she's working her way back. She's not fully back yet, but they're involving her in most of the activity, most of the drills she's able to participate in, but um, whatever was done uh, was a success. And she's looked like she shouldn't miss any time. And she, I imagine she'll play in the spring exhibition match and will be a full goal go for uh, the summer workouts as well, too. So that was kind of the other big thing of she because she sat out beach season uh, along with Kennedy or is more of a precaution than anything else. But yeah. um, the one other thing that I thought was really significant, we talked to Bergen Riley in addition to Krause and John Cook, that uh, she really kind of talked about how she feels a lot more comfortable. This is their second spring, um, knows what to expect, kind of knows what, uh, know, knows what's going on, has been through a college season. And she just, I don't, I don't know if he, if it's possible for Bergen Ryan, this team more confident, but she seemed to take a lot more ownership of the offense and be real, be more of a collaborative role with both Kelly and uh, Kelly Hunter and John Cook on what the offense is going to look like. Yeah. I think um, there's been a lot of times in the past where, 
Um, John Cook has to earn, or excuse me, a setter has to earn John Cook's trust for them to kind of put their foot on the gas a little bit more and and maybe run a, a setter friendly offense. I know it was that way when Kelly was there, and and I get a sense from you know, when we've talked to Jalen uh, on this show before that 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 might be loosening up a little bit. I think Bergen probably earned a lot of Cook's trust uh, in the first year, and maybe you're going to see them go a little faster or take a few more risks or something that, that she's kind of earned the right to do when you, when you set your team to the national title match as a, as a true freshman. So uh, just one of the great things I, I like about following Nebraska volleyball is watching players grow over their college careers. And Bergen Riley already came in at, at such a high level. And now she's going to, um, to, to see where you can go from there. And, and she, she's going to get a chance, right. To see what she can, to show what she can do on an international level again, because she's part of this, under 21 team USA lineup that, or at least she's on the, she's on the initial roster that's going to get trimmed down, but man, there's a lot of Husker and future Husker Husker adjacent players on that. Yeah. I think, I think I like her odds. I think there's three setters on that roster. Uh, two of them have t- ties to Nebraska too. I mean, Bergen Riley and then uh future 2025 commit Campbell Flynn too. So um, I'm trying to think who the third setter was and I'm blanking on it right now, but I, 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 I like Bergen's odds to be able to shepherd that team and be the setter on that. And that'll be really good for her to get international experience too. Uh, but since you kind of hinted at it, uh, there'll be, so there's a pool of 20 that was invited to go through team workouts and kind of essentially a, a loose tryout, just to kind of see how the pieces fit in that seven of them have ties to Nebraska too. So a third of the player pool uh, more than a third, I should say, uh, has ties to Nebraska too. So we mentioned Bergen Riley, Campbell Flynn, et cetera. Uh, two of the three libero defensive specialists also have ties to Nebraska. Uh, sophomore Laney Choboy and uh, freshman Olivia Mack is also on that list as well too. Um, Andy Jackson at middle blocker, uh, Harper Murray, and then another 2025 commit, uh, Tara, Tara, Tariah. Tariah Sigler, who's an outside hitter, um, depending on which recruiting publication you like, it may be the number one player uh, in the 2025 class, but they're all going to be in the pool, have a shot to make that final roster of 12 people. Yeah, and the, this is where this these players are going to compete is going to be at the Norseca Under-21 Championship. So there's not like a World Under-21 Championships that I think happened last year. Yeah. Um, but a lot of these players have Team USA youth experience in the past, which I think has kind of shown that it makes you more likely to get picked for these teams as you get a little bit older. So Bergen Riley not only set on what was it the under 19 national team she sat a ma- set a match for the senior national team yeah was it uh, last six. last summer too which is insane when you think she was probably like 17 at the time yeah high school um, senior year yeah yeah and so jalen reyes uh, husker assistant is going to be an assistant coach on that team uh head coach of that team is heather olmstead who's the the head coach at byu and so these players are going to be playing um Again, I, I make the comparison. Norseca is just CONCACAF for volleyball. It's North and Central America and Caribbean, that kind of regional championship. And that's going to be um, held up in Toronto uh, this summer, right before the Olympics. So we'll get a chance to watch these uh, players compete in Team USA jerseys right before some other former Huskers probably make the, the Paris Olympic team. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a good time to do that. And a lot of Husker favorite flavor will come out and we'll see who makes the final cut. But I imagine with Jalen going out that uh, there'll be a lot of Nebraska ties to that as well, too. So uh, last thing I have on the list, too, uh, I wrote an article for Volleyball Mag that published at the end of last You got Jared a raise, didn't you? I did. No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, But I I wrote a story in mid-February, which was kind of the timing worked out, um, that uh, about comparing what college volleyball coach salaries to what basketball is and kind of all that. Uh, Jared Elliott got a new extension that was announced in uh, late or no, it was mid, I think March 11th is when it was announced. It was signed in late February, but it was announced by UT uh, in mid. So he is now the highest paid uh, college volleyball coach. He uh, will be getting $800,000. Uh, he's got the contract the last uh, couple of weeks, um, but uh, he was going to be, he's now surpasses John Cook as the highest paid. This is just based off of kind of base compensation. There's monet- mm-hmm. there's non-monetary compensation that goes into all of it, but he'll be getting $800,000. Uh, John Cook for the 2024 season will be getting seven fifty. dollars So uh, Jared Elliott, the coach of the uh, uh, back-to-back national champions is now the highest paid mm-hmm. college volleyball coach. 
at least as far as we can tell in public universities, maybe yes. there is a chance that Stanford is just wheeling wheelbarrows of money up to Kevin Hambly's house yeah. like every other Friday. But, um, you know, he, he's probably well compensated. I, I doubt he's making uh, what Jared Elliott is making. But, you know, you win back to back national championships. You got some negotiating leverage, right? Yeah. The one of the interesting thing about his contract, too, is that his base pay actually went down from like, he was like five, I think, 87. His base pay went down to five hundred thousand dollars. But he signed a uh, part of the deal where his now a, a corporation and an S corp that he's now in charge of is getting three hundred thousand dollars for intellectual rights, like media appearances, um, doing other, other things related mm. to the co coaching world that's not directly coaching. So he, uh, I, I, you see that a little bit more in the basketball world and the football world. Um, but that's the first that I know of and kind of my review of all the contracts that that's existing for um, the volleyball world too. So that's a little bit interesting twist on that. Uh, Probably some know, tax advantages to such a setup, wouldn't you say? Yes, there are. That is what I, I called one of my accounting friends. And that's what she said is why you would do that. So it's, a tax advantage to kind of yeah. lessen their personal liability. But although Texas famously as a state has no state income income tax, which is why a lot of professional athletes find ways to like have a PO box in Texas to, uh, to, uh, you know, avoid, avoid paying the tax man just a little bit more. Yes. Although at that level of money, you know, they're probably not sweating, writing a check to uncle Sam too much every April. No, for sure. Yeah. So it's an interesting deal too. And he also has the director of volleyball title that was added. So I think he can get bonuses for how the Texas beach team does as well too. So uh, it's a very interesting contract. So go to go over to volleyballmag.com uh, and uh, check out that story that uh, published uh, the tail end of last week. We're going to come back next year. He's going to be like an assistant vice chancellor, the assistant <laughs> vice chancellor of volleyball, Jared Elliott. Hey, by the time you hear our next show, Nebraska will probably have played their spring match uh, against Denver May 4th in Kearney. We'll talk about that match. And uh, who knows? Maybe we'll look into some Team USA stuff coming up in our next show. Until then, you can rep the podcast by buying some merch. If you are so inclined, go to herdatsports.com slash shop. You can get uh, some fine merch. This Volleyball State t-shirt I'm wearing Ooh, nice. right now. Lincoln's got hats. You can get our bald set spike shirt. A uh, favorite of the ladies is the Justice for Liberos t-shirt. And uh, all of that goes to uh, to support the show and, and help us grow this community and you know, helps us bring on awesome guests like Jordan Larson. Thanks again for, for being with us, Jordan. Uh, Lincoln, you want to tell folks how they can subscribe yeah. and review and do the, all the other back padding things we're asking them to do? Oh, yes. Yeah. Go find us on most of any of your favorite podcasting platforms. If you're having trouble with our podcast not popping up, unsubscribe, resubscribe. I had that problem with our first episode a couple of times ago. It wasn't popping up in my feed. You unsubscribe, resubscribe. It doesn't help our numbers at all, but it'll make sure it pops up when new episodes drop. Uh, you can also interact with us at Volleyball Pod at Twitter. Uh, we also have a TikTok page where we kind of post some clips of uh, the upcoming podcast drops. We may create some new content for that, but get teasers for our new podcast there. Uh, if you have questions, want to inter interact with us, share your thoughts, email us at volleyballstate at gmail.com. If you want to interact directly with me, you can do that on Twitter at Lincoln underscore VB. And Jeff, where can they find you on Twitter? You can find me on Twitter at by Jeff Sheldon, just like a byline, B-Y Jeff Sheldon. Thanks so much to Cam Broham for producing today's show. Thanks very much for Jordan Larson for being our guest. And thanks to Herd at Sports for giving us this home to talk about volleyball with you as we do every so often on Volleyball State.